Good yep. morning. I would love to introduce Linda Griffiths Brown from Total HRM as uh, for this business spotlight interview. So welcome, Linda. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to have a chat, Phil. Excellent. So, uh, Linda, can you please introduce what your business is and what it is that you do? How do you, how do you serve your customers? <laughs> so the um, business we have, uh, Total HRM, is a HR consulting business. Uh, so we work with clients in the areas across HR, recruitment, and then training and coaching. Uh, our view is that um, we empower people to thrive. That's really our belief around what we do. And so it's working with business owners to ensure they're in the best position uh, to work with their teams, to have the right people around them, and then putting the systems and process in place to allow everyone to be their best when they're at work. Fantastic. And how long have you been in business for then? Uh, so the business has been around for about 15 years and I've had the business for eight. So I actually started off as a client of the business. So um, I was working for a government agency at the time looking to outsource HR and finance and we outsourced HR to this local business called Total HRM. And then uh, I left that organisation and was going to start my master's. And the woman, Judy, who had the business at the time said, well, do you want to come and do some work for me? So I had my first day working for her, absolutely loved it. Uh, and so never started the masters. And mm -hmm. uh, so I was a client and then I was um, you know, working for, for the business owner. And then six months later, I bought the business. So that's how an engineer ends up running a HR consulting business. <laughs> Fantastic. But, so that sounds like it was a really exciting journey then. It was. Um, I've, I've learned a lot along the way. I'd always worked, um, most of my career has been uh, working for a couple of large uh, multinational organisations and running a small business is a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, very different when you're the one who has to ensure that you make payroll, um, all of those mm -hmm. kind of things. The so things around cash flow and that kind of thing is very different than when you work for a large corporation. Uh, and probably the other thing I've, I've also learned a lot along the way in terms of when I first um, uh, had the business, really I bought a job. So I really bought a job rather than the business. Um, there was a lot of working in the business. And then over time, I've built the business up. So rather than it just being me, uh, to now I've got it, there's a team of us um, that work in the business. So yes, yeah, certainly learned a lot of lessons along the way. Uh, and it's just, I've got to say, it's the most rewarding uh, role I absolutely love it I love the clients that we work with we've got um, business partners that um, we work with and then also the team like in terms of um, employees um, that we have in the team it's just absolutely fantastic so very very rewarding but uh, certainly challenging along the way uh, with things like COVID and, and that kind of thing as well yeah we'll, we'll get get on to COVID in a minute so um, what sort of geographic area do you cover then uh, so we've got clients, for example, in Perth and Sydney would be examples of where we have clients. Uh, but yep. primarily, um, we work with clients uh, in the northeast Victoria and southern uh, New South Wales. Well, so mm -hmm. sort of Wagga Wagga, clients in Shepparton, um, and along, you know, really along the Murray River. Um, so there's the clients that we work with on site. So we have quite a few clients where um, the team are on site with them, and that might be you know, half a day a week, it might be um, two, three days a week. Uh, so those clients, uh, because it is on site work, that's that's around this part of the world, uh, but certainly able to support clients remotely in places like Perth and Sydney. Wow, that, that, that's uh, fantastic. So Linda, who would make an ideal client for your business? <laughs> uh, so we probably have um, some different types of clients. So uh, we have quite a few, uh, like a, a base level of clients that work in the, they're in the government space. So that would be uh, local government, government agencies, uh, you know, state government agencies, that kind of thing. So they're, they're one part of our client base. Um, we have another group of clients um, who are, uh, you know, that medium sized businesses uh, who some of them have uh, an on site HR resource, uh, some of them may not. 
um, where we're supplementing or providing um, HR support to them. And then the other group of clients is small business owners. Uh, so that might be someone who's uh, hiring someone for the very first time and wants to make sure they get it right. Uh, but our sort of, you know, size is usually around that at least sort of 10 to 15 employees is quite often. But we do have, as I say, quite a lot of clients who maybe have um, one to five employees and they just want to make sure they get their basic HR systems right. Uh, and yep. that's what we support them with. Um, have of that sort of small to medium sized business, we have quite a lot of um, family businesses that we work with. Uh, right. so that might be often um, second or third generation uh, family businesses. Uh, so they're they're a lot of fun to work with, and um, you know, really developing that uh, the next generation that's coming through and developing their skills to be able to uh, lead the their their business um, and leave that legacy as well. Uh, yep. with, quite often that focus of the, the family business owners. Yeah, now that, that's great. So, um, yeah, uh, before we jumped on the, the call, we were talking a little bit about COVID. So when, when you think about COVID and the, all the changes that uh, I, I guess that was forced on us through, through that period, what are some of the things that have really stuck with your business from that COVID experience? Uh, so one of the things that um, interestingly really got us through that whole period was recruitment. So recruitment went from being maybe uh, less than a fifth of our business to being over half our turnover was recruitment later. Uh, wow. Recruitment focused. Uh, so it was something that because of the shortages and the difficulties people were having in finding people, they, they would then turn to an organisation like us. And it might be the first time they'd actually worked with a HR business. It was actually you know, in the area of recruitment. Uh, so that was one area that has really you know, developed that whole space for us as a business. Uh, what yep. we found was um, it's only just now that our on-site HR consulting work has really picked back up again. So it's taken a while for that to... Right kind of rebound. Uh, probably the biggest thing which really came as well out of that recruitment space was that ability to talk to people um, online like we're doing today. Mm. Uh, so uh, business owners far more comfortable with recruiting people that they may have never met in person, but making sure we've got the right steps and processes in place to ensure it's the right candidate, but actually, yeah, recruiting people remotely. Uh, and that ability to work with clients like those in Sydney or Perth, where you can do all of that work remotely. You don't have to have someone um, local. If it's someone who is a fit for your business, uh, then it doesn't matter really where they work, uh, being able to do that. Um, the other thing was then also around flexibility for employees. And I think that's for our business, but it's for a lot of businesses, that where mm. you have employees that are, prime, you know, that are office-based, um, that ability to be able to work from anywhere. Um, so whether that be you who's uh, overseas at the moment when we're having this conversation, um, whether that be uh, someone who's got some, you know, commitments that they're needing to work around, that ability to work remotely. Uh, and for myself who lives over an hour away from the office, you know, that ability to not need to come into the office every day um, and being able to do that work remotely. Um, I know that we use um, Office 365 and I've got to say, I never saw the point of Teams. I thought, what's the use of a system like Teams, um, but now totally besotted with a, a system like Teams. It just, um, it's actually one of the foundational systems that we now use uh, to actually drive the business forward in terms of managing work, um, communications between team members, uh, access to our documentation, that kind of thing. So I think that was the other piece is really understanding the value of IT, um, you know, making sure you have the security systems in place so you don't get hacked, yep. that kind of thing. Uh, so that was probably the other, you know, other piece that came out of it was just really that um, the importance of technology and that it can be utilised for good. I, and, and look, I think, uh, you yeah, know, what you've just shared with us is basically all the things, the changes that most businesses uh, have actually been going through as a result of COVID. So, yeah, well done. Thank you. Um, and um, just on that, if I can add, Phil, um, what that's meant to is opened up candidate pools for clients because you, your employees, if it is office space work, don't necessarily have to live in the city that you're in. So here we are in uh, regional uh, Victoria, New South Wales, um, up here on the border, Aubrey-Wodonga. 
Um, we've got clients now who have employees that say, for example, are Sydney based. Now, I think mm -hmm. it is important to build the relationships and rapport with people. So actually having them, I've got a, a team member, for example, who lives on the Mornington Peninsula, about once a month, um, she'll come up here and we actually have all of the team get together. So I think what's really mm -hmm. important if you're going down that path of people who are remote is to still ensure that you establish great relationships within the team and have the systems where they feel you know, supported and part of the team. So one of the team members, um, it was uh, uh, her birthday. So we org organized an Uber Eats delivery um, yep. of cake to her house. Um, it's, it's just those little things that even though someone's remote and they miss out a lot of those things that may occur in the office, that they still feel part of the team and connected to the team. So I think that, that it's a great opportunity for us, but at the same time, you need to manage, manage your employees. Right. And your team yeah, ab absolutely important. And um, so, Linda, what's been the, uh, say, the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome on your journey in business? Uh, for me, it was moving from, it's probably two things and they're related, moving from basically buying a job to, to actually having a business. And then the other big one was uh, that piece around paying staff and not yourself. And I think, you know, cash flow is king when it comes to um, having a small business, but that whole piece around understanding that you're actually the most important person in the business and you need to pay yourself first and yep. then and then it's ensuring that you have the sufficient funds that if you when you're bringing on or adding on team members uh that mm. you can actually sustain that with all of the ups and downs that can occur in terms of things like cash flow and work and that kind of thing so you know if the pipeline yep. of work dries up um, where, you know, something like COVID or in our case, it was also the fires. So we had the fires um, in this region before COVID. So we actually had a, a chunk of work cancelled before the fire, uh, with the fires before COVID hit. And then we had that double whammy of then um, COVID occurring. And uh, so, yeah, making sure you got the cash flow that any employees you bring on, you can afford. But it's that, yeah. do you have, do you have a job or a business? And then that second one, which is and paying yourself first, um, is just yep. so important. Yep. So, Linda, at what point did you realise that, or at what point did you make that transition from being a job to then being a business owner? What What was the thing that triggered it for you? Um, I'll, I'll jokingly say it was getting the big black photocopier that that's just amazing and prints and does everything. And I sort of felt like I was a proper business owner because I had a big <laughs> copy machine. Um, I, I joke, but I'm kind of a little bit serious. I think, I think for me, it was, I had team members that um, came on probably within four to six months of me um, having the business and they were, you know, doing some um, casual work for me, that kind of thing. It, it was probably at the time I didn't realise that I had a job and not, and not a business until probably I think it would be more sort of that three to four years in. I think transitioning from working from home, working out of cafes, libraries, all of that kind of thing, uh, to then actually having your first office space. Um, and mm -hmm. now it's just a one room office space and having some part time employees. Uh, to then very much now the space that we're in, we're in a building now um, with a, a, an amazing training space um, as part of that building. Uh, that certainly cemented the transition, but I would say it probably took me three to four years and I didn't realise I had a job until in retrospect I was reflecting on what I'd been through and, and starting to realise that now I actually had a business and not a job because you were spending that time needing to work on the business uh, rather yeah rather than just all that hands-on being in the business, being busy, being busy. Yeah, fantastic. And so along this journey, what's the biggest thing that you've actually learned about yourself? About myself? Uh, the thing I've learned, particularly in the last year and a half, is I thought I was indispensable. Um, so I, I, I was of this perception, I think, that the business would fall apart without me. Um, and... What I've realised in the last year and a half is when you have great team members and, and great people around you, that the business can run without you. 
Um, so whether that's being having that ability to, you know, go on a, you know, just before COVID hit, we, we had a four week um, holiday overseas. Um, so that mm -hmm. ability to actually have and, and, and rely on the team to run things while, while you're gone to the last year and a half where um, uh, I've got um, uh, some health stuff going on. Um, I've got long COVID and uh, that just means that uh, I can't be as active in the business anymore and the business is continuing to run. It's growing, it's thriving um, and, you know, that's without me. Um, and so lovely position to be in, although I actually love working and so would prefer to be, um, you know, working uh, a lot, but that's that whole piece of you're actually not in, indispensable. So if you put the right systems and process in place, so we have lots of systems around how we do things and mm. videos showing you how to do things. Uh, and if you hire good people, then uh, they're able to, to run things, run things, even if you're not there. Uh, and look, that's been a transition too around the ego. So it's that piece around wanting to feel like you're indispensable and, you know, you love it when clients just want you. Um, but how much better is that when clients actually love having your team members um, it's just that trans transition, I think, of getting over the ego around that uh, and that success yep. makes many forms. So you can have a successful business that, you're, uh, that you are involved in, uh, but you're not necessarily the one out and about. Uh, and that's actually okay. And as long as the ego can handle it, it it's all good. <laughs> well, con congratulations, because I, you know, in, in my words, I, I actually call that the super person syndrome. <laughs> where nobody else can do it as good as I can. And I see so many examples of where the business owner suffers from that. That mm -hmm. is, they're not trusting their, their team to do the right things. Um, and that's the thing that actually holds the business back from progressing and, and growing and expanding. So, yeah, well done. Absolutely. Well, and I think the thing with that too is, is uh, we can think that, uh, you know, that whole piece around we do things better than others, we think we know better than others. My view is I love hiring people who are smarter than me, who are better at these things than I am. I've, I've got someone in the team who's just joined us who's amazing in that I uh, return to workspace far more yep. so than what I am. How cool is that, right? And, and they love being part of the team and I don't have to be the expert on everything. Uh, which is absolutely fabulous. It's, it, but it's around transitioning to allow yourself to do that. And unfortunately, it can be that it is something like a health reason is, there, is why you can't be as involved in the business. But if you didn't focus on putting the systems and processes and having the right people around, then if you have that something like a health crisis, then, then the business can actually implode and it, and it won't thrive in the, under those circumstances. Yep if you haven't put the groundwork in place for the business to be able to thrive, even if you're not there. I, I couldn't agree more. So uh, yeah, congratulations again. Well done. Thank you. Um, Linda, in terms of, uh, I guess, your industry, what, what do you see as being the major challenges going forward? Um, mm, interesting question. Uh, I think uh, AI is going to be interesting to see what, part mm -hmm. and role that plays in an industry like HR. Uh, I think the this piece around the human connection is still so important in the HR space. And yes, there are, are elements of it that are relatively transactional and AI can uh, streamline processes and make things, uh, you know, more effective. Mm -hmm. Where my concern though is that where what the AI is using to make decisions though is is their inherent bias as an example uh, in the AI. So uh, how do we ensure that the AI does not assume, for example, that doctors are male and nurses are female, uh, where there's already there's already some information out there which is saying AI makes those kind of generalities. So I think the challenge is going to be how do we harness the power of AI to make, our work more effective and efficient mm -hmm. without compromising on the, the ensuring that there's not inherent bias in those processes and that we're giving everyone um, equal opportunity to be able to, you know, for example, apply for a job. 
Um, you know, there's already systems that can already screen resumes for you. Uh, mm. We'll actually do the, the, the first call, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, for me, there's still something about uh, calling someone up like we're doing today, Phil, and having that conversation with a candidate. Uh, I, I guess I'm still a little bit old fashioned in that way, but I think there's there's something around that and I wouldn't want to rely on AR wholeheartedly uh, to run a recruitment process. So how that's going to work with time, I think will be really interesting to see how that's going to play out. Um, I think the other thing is it's equipping the other thing in our industry, it's really around, which is around that uh, training and coaching piece is equipping our leaders for the challenges that we not only already have today, but those that we're gonna to continue to have in the future. So whether that be around managing a team that uh, is filled with people of different backgrounds, who might be some on site, some remote, someone might actually be overseas, uh, living overseas mm. and, and working for you. So how do you actually have that sense of teamwork, um, creating that culture that you want? Uh, it's continuing to develop uh, leaders' emotional intelligence uh, around understanding themselves and others and how they influence that. So, you know, it's that whole piece, I think, as well, that uh, it's around uh developing our leaders uh, to face all of those challenges that we've got coming up. Yep. Thank you for that. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really curious about this AI journey as well. Mm. And um, I know my team is, is already starting to use it, but, you know, being quite wary about making sure that, you know, you just don't accept what it's giving you. You've, you've really got to read it and, and amend it to, to make sure that, hey, the, the message is not getting lost in the translation. Absolutely agree. Uh, and you can already tell, for example, things that are uh, some things, obviously not all that are written by AI, for example. So it's around, you know, how do we use it for good? Uh, I yep. think uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting challenge for us and, and opening up opportunity, though, as well. And this is areas where I think uh, particularly that creativity piece you know, how do we harness um, people's creativity? Uh, and how do we, you know, what, what are we going to do for people who maybe are in jobs at the moment uh, that aren't going to, that AI is going to potentially take over those roles? So whether that be, you know, uh, you know, assembling cars, for example, where everything can, you know, be effectively automated, whereas before it used to involve a lot of people, how is that going to work with, uh, it might be bookkeeping services, as an example, where a lot of the matching, a lot of the work that's done by bookkeepers might be able to be done by AI. So how are we actually going to manage that transition and how do we manage that not only within your own team, within your business, but also just more generally in terms of the community and the community impact that might have? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, again, I totally agree with that. So. Um, Linda, finally, what other words of wisdom might you have for any aspiring um, people that are looking to get into business? <laughs> uh, one, I'd say go for it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I would say do your homework in terms of making sure you understand the business that you have. So whether that be one that you're starting yourself or that you're buying, make sure you've got the money behind you so that if things don't come off in terms of the sales um, that you've actually got that, um, you know, that uh, financial buffer to make sure things are going to be okay. Uh, I think it is around ensuring that you have a good coach uh, to, to help you through that journey as well. And uh, they can help you with avoiding a lot of the pitfalls and traps. Sometimes there is that element if you do want to learn some, learns, some lessons yourself, uh, but what you don't want to do is to have that cost you too much around, around the process um, about learning that lesson. Uh, so having having a good coach, I think, is really important. So that really strong, uh, you know, person who's an accountant, for example, or a bookkeeper that's helping you on the financial side, it's around that coach, um, you know, men, uh, it's coach, and then probably also mentors, just someone that you can bounce those ideas off, um, which is different, different again, to having a coach. But absolutely, um, go for it. Uh, you know, I see a lot of people now who are starting up their, their business as a side hustle. So they're actually still ensuring they have some income uh, while they get the business off at the ground. I think it's that whole point of you can't steal second base while you still have your foot on first. 
at some point you have to make that leap, right? So if you think about yep. you know, baseball or softball analogy, uh, at some point you need to make, you know, to have that leap. So it is about backing yourself, but making sure you have that support and that financial support around you when you take it. It's it's an amazing roller coaster ride. Absolutely love it. Uh, I could never go back to uh, working for others again. Uh, just yep. I, I just absolutely love the experience of uh, being a small business owner and uh, giving back not only to our clients uh, and our team, but also to the community in which we work. So um, yeah. There's nothing better. Thank you so much. Great words of wisdom, Linda. And thank you for sharing your journey in business. Thanks, Phil. And, and thanks, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk with you this morning. I really appreciate it. Okay. Bye now.